Well, Trinity College, as we all know, enjoys the status of being the oldest university in Ireland. I think we've established that. And today, in honour of this, we celebrate the 425th anniversary of the foundation in 1592, captured so beautifully in the Hatfield painting. But the site of Trinity College has a much earlier birthday than this, and today I want to talk about what was here before the college was founded, based on the documentary sources and on two archaeological watching briefs that I carried out, one in Library Square for a new water pipe, and the second in Front Square, where, where the new paths were laid through the cobbles, I'm sure you've all seen them. Now, both these pro uh, projects, although not actual excavations, not archaeological excavations, they still nevertheless produce significant information about the prehistory of Trinity College. In the Hatfield depiction, we see a plan of the college rather than the finished product in a view from the west, the quadrangle stone-faced in the exterior, but with a very attractive red brick facing internally, looking into the paved courtyard. Parliament Square forms the western frontage facing onto the medieval city and defined by a brick wall with a fine front gate in roughly the same location as the front gate is today. And I just want to point out the steeple in the northern range, which appears to be set apart from this block in a relatively unusual position. And this forms a clue to the unraveling of what was here before the college was founded. The quadrangle, the college quadrangle, perhaps surprisingly to some in college, survived relatively intact right up until the mid 18th century. Therefore, its position is well known, as represented here on a map dated to 1756 by Rock. This is unscaled, but it nevertheless uh, uh, highlights the position of the quadrangle. And here we see the quadrangle marked with the hall and chapel in the northern range, flanked by Library Square on the eastern side, which was laid out in about 1700. And the western end, as you can see, is annotated Old Square and has not been transformed into the Parliament Square we know today. So where was the old college in the modern topography? Well, roughly speaking, the Camp Campanile marks the northeast corner of the quadrangle, the southern range extending back under the footprint of house number one and the examination hall. So thus, the monumental vista and sense of space one gets on coming through Frontgate, that iconic experience that we all have all had, is in sharp, sharp contrast to the narrow and congested quadrangle that would have greeted the visitor in the 18th century until, of course, the great plan was put into action from the mid-18th century onwards, and it was all gradually de demolished. And I wonder, was there much opposition to the demolition of this very early historic college at the time? So having established where the old college was, what do we know of what went before? Well, we know the site of the college was certainly not on virgin soil and had had a long history of occupation and usage. In Viking times, it formed part of Hogan Green, which was a large Viking cemetery and public green that formed the eastern suburb of the fortified Viking port of Difflin or Dublin in and around Christchurch. And you can see the walled town there on the map. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, the site was right beside a landing stage or small harbor on the River Liffey that was known as the Stain or Longstone which was in use well into the late medieval period. And this was a very important feature, <coughs> as there was deep water here all the time, unlike further upstream at the Keys, which was tidal, of course, because the Liffey is tidal. With the medieval road along the shoreline, heading south towards Riggins End, the site of the college was, in fact, a very busy spot, unlike the happy de depiction, which almost places it in a very uh, rural location. And in fact, it was such good real estate that it was chosen as the site of a very important monastery known as the Priory of All Hallows, or sometimes known as All Saints. Now, this monastery was founded in 1166 by none other than Dermot McMurra, King of Leinster, infamous, of course, for having invited the Anglo-Normans or English into Ireland to help recapture his Kingdom of Leinster, and so pre precipitating the invasion of Ireland in 1169. So quite a reputation for the founder of the monastery. The monastery was an important and wealthy foundation in Dublin for over 380 years before being finally dissolved in 1538 during the general dissolution of the monasteries, after which it was granted the mayor and people of Dublin. So there has, there has been a community living on this very site, engaging and serving the population of medieval Dublin for almost 400 years before the college was established. Well, fortunately, we have no map of the, the monastery. The earliest plan is the Hatfield, followed by Speed's map, which was just 20 years after the college was established. 
but the historical sources can help fill in the gaps. Property at the time of the dissolution, along with the precinct, consisted of 12 acres of meadow, nine acres of pasture, I'm sure the building office would love this, and seven orchards, equating to approximately 70 modern acres. So beyond the present island site of 47 modern acres, so it was bigger. However, there are also specific references to the actual monastic precinct and buildings. And these refer to the graveyard, the cloister, the church and vestry, a steeple, a stone building with a vault, a great hall, a tower over the gate adjoining Haugen Green, along with orchards and a field called Ash Park, where the monks had their haggard or farmyard and cistern. Incidentally, there's also a reference in 1539, well before the college was built, to the stone walls of the porter's lodge at Haugen Green roughly where the modern Portal Lodge is today. And although all the old colleges have these, I like to think it represents a tangible link with a former monastery that the place name is still in common usage. So where exactly was the monastic quadrangle? Well, it's highly likely that quite a lot of the monastery survived the dissolution and that the location of the tower on speed, which I pointed out earlier, represents the steeple of the monastic church, which would normally be in this position within the Northern Range. And this is also on the Hatfield depiction. So straight away then, when we look at the college layout and the, and the typical monastic layout, we can see the similarities. If this is the case, this of course would anchor the position of the monastic quadrangle with this formalistic layout in the modern, ty ty uh, in the modern topography. It would also demonstrate that the position of the monastery and the new college quadra quadrangle are one and the same. If this is the case then, this raises another interesting possibility, that the college builders simply reused part of the monastic quadrangle in 1592. As this was not demolished until the mid-18th century, potentially then part of the monastery, albeit hidden, may have actually been standing until this time. The actual monastic precinct on the slide I've shown you there, it, we know extend further west from the quadrangle, as we know there was an outer bone and the gatehouse that I mentioned previously. So essentially, the layout of the college and the monastery, as depicted on Hatfield, was almost identical. So two facts hinted at the archaeological potential of Front Square. One, the site of the monastery is within what is now mostly open cobbles. In other words, it hasn't been built on. And two, a couple, a couple of previous investigations suggested that the deep infill deposits found elsewhere in college were not present in Front Square probably because this was originally higher ground in the medieval period. So basically, when the dem demolitions were carried out from the mid-18th century onwards, instead of taking everything off site, they simply spread the material right across the college. So the entire college has been raised up the ground level from the Provost House as far east as Westmoreland Street. But in Front Square, this infill deposit was missing. The first confirmation of the location of the monastery came in 1998 in the investigation in Library Square. So this work exposed the walls of the original west range of the square, but also unexpectedly human remains at the northern end, one meter below the surface. The investigation found par partially articulated skeletons, five in all. Critically, were, they were orientated east-west and therefore clearly Christian burials. The density in the small area, it was just a trench, suggested of a, of a graveyard rather than a casual burial. A second discovery in the southeast corner suggested there were originally burials in this location also. Thus, it was likely the original graveyard attached to the monastery was in Library Square. This graveyard is listed, listed in the grant to the monastery to the mayor and was therefore an extant topographical feature, perhaps even reflected in the Library Square layout in other words, the boundaries of the square may actually owe their origins to the layout of the early cemetery, which is an exciting thought. In addition to this, the foundations of a wall located at the northern end of the square is likely to have been medieval in date, and this was possibly a northern boundary wall. Monitoring this trench, this, little, this small trench then, pinpointed the location of the cemetery and established the potential for medieval layers to survive in this location. The monastic precinct was clearly somewhere very close. The second significant program of works was, as I mentioned earlier, the laying of the paths. And this, of course, was of extreme interest as they extended through Front Square, including the potential site of the monastery. The surprise here again was, unlike elsewhere in college, the structural remains lay very close to the surface in the area of the quadrangle, lying just 300 millimeters below the cobbles, that's 30 centimeters. 
These important trenches then revealed a myriad of features, including buildings, drains, walls, cobbles, surfaces, as well as significant, significant deposits of brick and clay. Included in these were medieval walls, which are usually identifiable in Dublin by their width. They're usually over one meter wide. Their use of well-cut limestone block, which is quarried locally, and their distinctive yellow lime mortar. And of course, there's no brick, so this is how we recognize these walls. The first significant find was the location of the east range of the old college, instantly recognizable by the use of the distinctive bright orange brick that we saw in the Hatfield depiction. And this is a very early use of brick in Dublin documented. And this discovery, of course, provided an anchor point for the eastern range. It also established the wall was built de novo and had not been reused. In other words, it had no medieval component and was built in the 16th century as part of the foundation of the, church, of the college. And this had been hinted on the map, on Rock's map, as the East Range was thinner than the rest. And you can see it there on the plan. Knowing where this range was allowed us to extrapolate the distance of the other Eastern Wall, because we know from an account by the, the then Provost, William Travers, who was Provost between 1594 and 6, the quadrangle measured approximately 50 meters, uh, 50 meters square, with an internal courtyard measuring approximately 34 meters. Thus, the east range was four, eight meters in width, which was found to be the case. Significantly, he tells us only the northern and western ranges were completed at the time of his writing, precisely the two ranges that we may have suspected had medieval origins. The northern range, as it contained the steeple that I showed you earlier, and the western range, as it is very wide on the rock map, and you can, again, you can see it there in the slide, the difference in the widths. Armed with this knowledge, the Western Range was immediately found. The West Wall, just outside house number one. We excavated out a section of this wall and found that it was over 1.2 meters in depth by 1.3 meters in width, with a distinct batter on the external side. Most critically, it was founded on green clay containing medieval pottery, so it was dated securely. And it matched the criteria for a typical medieval wall being composed of cut limestone and bonded with yellow lime mortar. And it was a very exciting find because it was just so evidently part of the monastic precinct. And you should notice how close it is to the surface there, literally under your feet. Now, on comparison with the old college, you can see immediately that it was very different. It's much wider, it's made of limestone, and it has no brick, which is very critical. The matching wall was found on the eastern side. Again, we could estimate where it was. And this measured 1.25 meters in width and was also com composed of limestone block, but was sealed by brick demolition layers, perhaps suggesting a reuse of the foundation, but it's impossible to tell in the tiny little trenches that we were dealing with. And the main thing is that the wall is there, again, just under the surface. Further north, only one trench extended through the northern range, which was very frustrating, because this is the one we, we were sure was medieval. But this trench e extended through the general location of the tower. Perhaps not surprisingly, deep deposits of limestone chips were found, a byproduct of demolition. In other words, they'd strip out all the blocks. And you can see in the slide there the, the limestone chips that were left. And these are over one meter in depth. Again, they're brick free. And they're within the area thought to have contained the tower. And you can actually see the abrupt line there where the, it's probably the northern edge of the actual tower. And if the projected line at the north range is correct, this tower, by, by the deposit we found, was almost six meters north-south, which again fits in with the cartographic sources, and located not quite on the corner of the quadrangle. Moving all the way to the southern end, at the, southern, at the southern range, the upper level of a substantial wall was also found just west of the old library and close to the surface, although this wall, you can see, is very badly damaged. Not much can be said. We didn't excavate in this location, but it was definitely medieval, composed of large limestone block and mortared with the same yellow mortar. Outside the quadrangle, two additional medieval wall foundations were located, and these were evidently part of the additional buildings that were mentioned in the documentary sources, because you must remember there were many, many buildings associated with the monastery. The first was set at a northeast-southwest angle, you can see it here on the slide, which doesn't match any surviving orientation in college. 
although a 17th century path in this location was orientated similarly. So this is reflective of a much earlier orientation in college that's utterly gone. This again was a substantial wall uh, over 1.3 meters in width and composed of limestone block. And again, you can see the bright yellow mortar. So all these walls look very, very similar. The last medieval wall was found further north, probably associated with the angled wall, and this was also a very substantial wall, measuring over 120 in width. So in conclusion then, the peaceful open expanse that is Front Square really masks what is essentially a major archaeological site in Dublin. And if we were to peel back the cobbles, we would uncover a network of old walls, buildings, cobbles and drains, including most probably the foundations of the many monastic buildings that are noted have existed in this space. And I should say the works we did do did expose a large number of buildings dating to the 17th and 18th century along Parliament Square. To date, we can piece together for the prehistory of, of Trinity College, we, we can pinpoint the location of the monastic quadrangle and the fact that it was reused by the college builders on the western side and probably the northern side. There were additional buildings, their foundations are there, just up, uh, under the cobbles waiting to be discovered. And that library square is almost certainly a physical remnant of the monastery. And now, rather fittingly, is part of the oldest part of college, containing the rubrics, the only surviving original range of the square. And it's interesting, interesting on rock that it's marked as new buildings, while front square was marked as old. So everything has its turn in Trinity. And I leave you with the final slide just to reflect in blue the number of walls that were found in what was really a very limited monitoring program. We were just putting in a few paths. We weren't going down any depth. And you can see how many, of, uh, how many walls were uncovered in that very brief program. So I think the top priority, therefore, going forward for the college must be to protect what is left of this very special place. Thank you. Thank you.